Hi and welcome to an episode of VAR On Demand. I'm here with the great Pat Garachi today from UDIA, so the Urban Development Institute of Australia and the South Australian branch. So Pat, thank you for coming on today. You're welcome. It's great to be here. Man, I'm so excited to do today's show. Um, land tax has been a big topic, obviously, in the press lately and with all professional industries, us being in real estate and finance and everything that's going on at the moment. Um, but firstly, can you tell us a little bit about UDIA and sort of what you do there? Sure, yeah. my pleasure. So the uh, Urban Development Institute uh, is an industry body that's been around uh, in South Australia since 1971. And uh, the Urban Development Institute uh, represents property uh, developers. So you'll uh, note there's a number of suburbs across Adelaide like West Lakes, Golden Grove, uh, Blackwood. All of these suburbs were created by property developers at some stage in the past uh, and those members like the Adelaide Development Company and uh, Fairmont and Hickenbotham and Lendlease what used to be a Delphin yeah. uh, they are all members of the UDIA and so they've been members since 1971 we have uh, in our membership uh, property developers but also those all those uh, services around property development so there are architects uh, engineers, planners, landscape architects, surveyors, conveyances. So everybody who's involved in the property development sector, including real estate agents, mm -hmm. uh, from from way to go, really, uh, they are uh, members uh, of the UDIA, uh, and we're we're the body that brings everybody together. So we play a, quite a special role. A number of other really good industry associations. Uh, like the Housing Industry Association, they'll, they'll focus on representing builders in a particular area. We're quite a, quite a broad church, yeah. but our primary bread and butter is uh, looking after and representing property developers. Fantastic. So you're sort of behind, you know, the behind the scenes and all that sort of development that goes on. And so you have to approve all those, those developments for the the people involved? Or you just sort of oversee it? Or how does it sort of yeah. work? So, so how it works is that um, the government really plays that role. So, yeah. so councils and government uh, and the state uh, planning commission will approve developments. We're really um, like the RAA for motorists, the UDIA, yeah. um, what happens is uh, members of the UDA pay uh, a membership fee, uh, and then they tell us about all the things uh, that uh, that require attention. So, for example, a property developer might say, uh, in this particular council, you're allowed to have a particular type of split contract for a development. Uh, in another council, um, we can't really get that to work because the council doesn't understand the complexities around financing. So yeah. the UDA will play a role in in, in bringing all of the developers together and putting a case to to the local government association or going to the government and we will represent them as a collective. So we don't approve or deny uh, any type of property developments per se, but we are there um, representing their interests. Because yeah. sometimes the government might say, it's hard to talk just to one developer because then the other one will say, well, you're not talking to me. So they, we play an important role where they can trust that we're representing the entire sector. Yeah. And we do have a charter to have good development in Adelaide. So they trust us because we've been around to know that we are looking for good outcomes that are for the benefit of the whole state. Well, fantastic. So I, I first heard you speak, um, the, the, the uh, cause we're in prospect, obviously the mm -hmm. prospect council put on yep. an event with the mayor and everyone talking sort of about development in the area mm -hmm. um, and what's sort of coming. And you were sort of the, the hot man of the nights, everyone sort of hear from you that night because uh, you know you specialise in sort of attacking against the the land tax that's coming in at the mm -hmm. moment that the Liberal government's sort of putting forward and yep. um, the Stephen Marshall party that sort of thing too. So currently, just so we can sort of break it down with the land tax from the very start, sure. if we have a look at land tax right now, how does it actually work if you're in a property right now? Yeah. Mm. So the important thing, th there are different. To be as clear as I can, yeah. there are different types of, of tax that you can pay. And one is stamp duty. So if you yep. buy or sell a motor vehicle, the same way as if you buy or sell a house, you will pay stamp duty. And everyone who's bought a house knows that at some stage they had a really big bill to pay, uh, a stamp duty bill. And, and that's on a transaction. Mm -hmm. Now that's different to land tax. Land tax is this tax that you pay if you have property. Now. It doesn't apply to what's called the principal place of residence. That means that's your house that you live in. Okay. You don't pay tax on that. You sure. pay council rates, um, but you don't pay the state government any tax. 
when you have an investment property and you purchase a second house or a third house or a fourth house, you pay what's called land tax. Now they charge you on what's called the unimproved value. So they're not really interested in what's on the land. So you might have a block of land that's vacant and there's nothing on it and you might have a, uh, a house and they're only interested in the value of the land. And what happens is depending on that value of land, you will pay a certain amount of land tax to the government. Sure. And they have these things called thresholds. So if the value of the land, for example, is worth $200,000, you won't pay land tax on that because the first threshold on which you have to start paying, so that means if you're over, it's over a certain amount, then you go in, you start to pay, and then depending on how much more it goes up even further. So for example, the new plant, the new tax regime by their government that they've announced is that if you have property land tax, a land value less than 450,000, you won't pay any land tax on that. Okay. As soon as you're above 450,000, if your block of land's worth more than 450,000, you're gonna start pay land tax. And, you, and then if it's a, above 1.1 million, you're going to pay even more. And so wow. they they use a percentage. So they'll say over 1.1 million, you'll pay 2.4%. So if your value of your property is a million dollars, then you will pay 24,000. So that's 2.4%. Yeah, right. And that's every year. And that's levied at 30th of June. So at 30th of June, if you own that, that land, you have to pay that, that land tax bill. If you were to buy it on 1 July, and you were to sell it before 30th of June next year, then you wouldn't pay the land tax. Okay. So it's, it's quite a crude system that mm. says 30th, midnight, 30th of June, that's that magic time. You, it's in your name, you're paying land tax. And that's so they're, they're trying to implement that for 2020. So yeah, so what they're doing is they're currently going through some changes where the government's made some, uh, so they made some announcements and it's a, it's a complex matter, but they basically said in the past, if you had a, um, what's called a trust, which is a, a legal way of holding um, land. If you had a trust and you had three of those trusts, for example, the amount of land tax that you had to pay was only cl calculated on each one. Each individual piece of land. Correct. Okay. What they've done is they've changed that and said, as at 20th of June, as of 2020, so 30th of June next year, sure. they will add all of those up if they're owned by the same person, and they will charge you land tax on the combined value. Now, of course, if you are under the threshold, you may not have paid land tax on each three of them. If sure. you are adding them all up, and they're above the threshold, you will pay land tax on that total value. Wow. So that means that for a lot of people who uh, thought that um, the government who was elected was going to reduce land tax, that are in that scenario are being faced with a, a bill that they would not have otherwise. Now, there are some things that the government have done that are positive. They've said that we will increase the threshold, so 450 before you start paying. And they've said that the top rate, which was 3.7, will bring brought down to 2.4. Mm. So there are some things they've said, but this change mm. is a really big change for people who haven't had to pay. And let's be clear, it was legal. Yep. It was nothing, it's been characterised as a, as a loophole. It's been characterised as something that's, that's, um, that's been exploited. But the Act, the law says, if you have a trust, you'll only be levied tax on that trust. So it's been very clear and very legal and no one's been breaking any laws by doing this. No. They've just changed the policy. Now, mm. Our issue is they've changed it with little or no notice. Yeah. So right now, um, as it stands, is it so? Two point four is what they're sort of trying to introduce as a, a sort of percentage. What, what's the percentage at now for land tax? So there's a lot. Of, there are different percentages. Yeah. So for example, at the highest rate, if you right now, if you were above five million, you would pay three point seven. Okay. Um, and then there's a threshold between one and five million where I think it, it was a little bit less and it goes down. Um, the, what they're saying is they'll have a rate of 2.4 for everything above 
1.1 million as of next year. So a lot of people who potentially had a property that was worth 3 million, 4 million, 5 million, if that's what their, sure. the value of their land was, they will see a reduction because the rate has been dropped under okay. this proposal. It hasn't been gone through the parliament yet. So large parcels, la people with those large value land holdings will see a reduction. So there are some mm. winners in that. But there are people who may have had three or four properties that were all smaller and uh, in trust and they weren't added together. Mm. That's called aggregation. Yeah. When they're added together under this proposal next year, they will pay land tax. Now, there is some argument to say that it is everybody should pay a, a bit and there is some argument to say that for those who've paid nothing, maybe they should pay some. Yeah. But the challenge we've got is the timing. This is, a, this is something that's happened uh, under a government that was elected to reduce tax. Yeah. And now this happens um, with less than a year's notice. And the challenge we've got as a property sector is it's not as simple as just saying, oh, okay, I'll sell today and it's on no. the market and done tomorrow. It takes time. Definitely. And if everybody is selling, if there are a lot of people in this position that are selling because they don't want to pay that land tax bill or can't afford that land tax bill, yeah. so it's about affordability. If you can't afford as an investor to foot that bill, yeah. you need to sell. Now, if everybody's selling at the same time, sure. pretty simple uh, law of uh, economics. If 100%. everybody's selling and there's more product, supply and demand, the price goes down, mm. and and what then happens is people will take a loss. And not only will they take a loss, they potentially will be subject to capital gains tax as mm -hmm. they've sold. So the CGT, that's another tax that goes to the federal government. They've lost value of their property, and even after all of that, they've still got a land tax bill. If they've got multiple properties, they're going to have to pay on the others. Exactly right. So, so it's so it's a, it, it is a, a bit of a shock and a mm. little bit of a disappointment for those people who, perhaps thought that, um, we would have a more competitive land tax regime. There are always winners and losers in reform, and unfortunately, there are a number of losers in this one. Definitely, and I can tell you firsthand, being you know a, a successful real estate business that. The investors are a big part of the market, right? And if, if you've already got investment properties you, and this sort of comes in, you're not going to be looking for other investment properties because you're going to be trying to get rid of your investment properties to reduce that, right? So half the market's not even going to be a, applicable to buy your property because, you know, the only people going to have to really sell to is only occupiers or first home buyers, which, you know, isn't always a great deal of the market depending on the location. So all I see happening in that from a real estate perspective is that there's going to be a glut of properties on the market with no one being able to buy them. Everything's just going to come crashing down sort of around it. And, and that's not just the real estate industry. That's construction. That's finance. Like, there's going to be a big hole in the market from this happening. That's what I foresee anyway being in property. Do you agree with that? or I think, look, that is, is absolutely true. The, mm. the thing about property, the thing about land is it can't just be easily moved. So it's yeah, not like a motor right. vehicle. And, <laughs> you know, when we see situations in the past where, you know, the Japanese would, would dump motor vehicles in Australia because they couldn't do, you know, a certain amount of kilometres. They, they weren't roadworthy after that. Yeah. Land is not a, a product that can be moved easily. But what we are, what we'll see is a segment of the market. So there will be a segment of interstate investors. Uh, there'll be local investors who, just through the sheer uncertainty of what's going on, will choose not to invest if they would have otherwise. Mm -hmm. And there will be people who hold product mm -hmm. that will be forced to sell. Now, like I said, land can't move anywhere. What it means is prices will, will change. And so there may be um, some people who get into the market who are first home buyers, who are owner occupiers, mm -hmm. but in the longer term, um, it, it might even out, but we, are, we will see a massive dislocation distortion. So just a couple of points, one is, sure. If you're a property developer and you're looking to, to put forward a project or you're in the middle of a project and you're faced with a whole bunch of uncertainty with people who are scared about investing and you've got the, the, uh, you're facing a whole bunch of people selling properties as a result of this uncertainty, it sends a message to those property developers that now a really tough time of, about whether or not I proceed with my project. So they're very, very nervous. But the flow on impact means Brickies, uh, Chippies, the people who sell dishwashers yep. at Harvey Norman, all of those related industries will feel the impact as that, that activity slows as a result 
of, of the uncertainty. And that's the issue that we see here. There may, reform is not easy, and perhaps the tax system, we agree, we've always said prior to the election, there needs to be reform to make it fairer and more mm, equitable. We've, we stand by that as a UDI. We've said that at the beginning, we'll say it again. But there's a way in which you go about reform, uh, and that is a, ref a, a true reform model doesn't create uncertainty and it doesn't leave a whole bunch of people kind of wondering what's going on. Mm. Um, and so we think that there's, there's a, the government could have done a better job mm. in rolling it out, um, but there, there will be, no doubt be impacts. The other thing, the other second point I wanted to make is there's a large proportion of the market who are rent, people who are in properties that rent. Now, if you are renting, mm -hmm. which means you're probably doing it tougher than many others, you, you don't have the luxury of affording your own place. If your landlord's got a higher tax bill, the incidence of that tax ends up on the Onto least you. the people who can mm. least afford it. 100%. So you might be a renter and you're inter impacted by the tax. The other thing is if the landlord can't afford the property and needs to sell it, that means someone potentially will get an eviction notice. I need to sell, you need to get out unless I can sell it to someone who wants to keep you there. So the dislocation Gosh. doesn't just happen to the investment market. That's it, so scary what it you're happens saying. To, it happens to a lot of other people and there's a lot of unintended consequences about having a reform project, a program that's mm. not rolled out properly. It's, it's just, it's really scary what you're saying because it can just, you can see it happening if, does the government know like that this would be the effects of it? Well, one of the challenges we've got um, and one of the things that's come to light is that uh, when the government first announced this process, they said that the aggregation measures, that's putting all the properties together and changing, sure. changing it, was going to raise $40 million. Mm -hmm. Just recently when they released the new uh, bill, uh, they came out and said that the modelling will now raise, in that measure, $118 million. So they're off by uh, more than a bit. Mm. <laughs> and um, it hasn't really given anyone any confidence. Um, but what it does tell us is that when somebody put this proposal up in front of the treasurer, when this was discussed, that they have um, clearly not thought through. And we, we were a little bit upset, as were many other industry bodies, about the fact that there could have been and should have been some consultation about this particular uh, measure. Uh, it was kind of um, just announced in the budget. Yeah, it's out of left field, wasn't and, it? Uh, <laughs> and, and, then, and then we were told that you would have to wait, and I think it was in 83 days or something, or there was, enough, there was a quite some time mm. before a bill was put before us. That only happened a couple of weeks ago, and we haven't got to the parliament yet. So there's still, there's a, there's a whole um, level of uncertainty. And, and any investment market, you'd know this, Michael, any Definitely. investment market, whether it's, it's the share market, or it's the property market, uncertainty is always the enemy of investors, mm -hmm. uh, and um, it's it's risk, risk and return. They are very. It's a very simple con concept, and and of course, when we've got investors from interstate, sure. say, what's the risk? Well, there's this stuff going on in land tax in South Australia at the moment. Yeah, um, we might just wait a little bit. Definitely, that's a, and that's not the right message we need to give to the rest of the country. Not after we're just sort of coming back from the banks putting the fear of God into everyone mm -hmm. <laughs> at the start of the year, and uh, I mean it was. It's been a quiet market. I mean, it's down 30% from sort of last year as well. Auctions are down, um, results are down. Uh, property stock itself is just down all over the place. It's just, that's how the market is at the moment. And then to have sort of, um, when we have had the election and Liberal got voted in, there was a bit more confidence put back into the market because, yeah. you know, brokers could still do their job and get paid from the banks and that sort of thing too. But then to have this has come straight after that, sort of just took that little bit of confidence and, and it made it actually worse because you know there's that much confusion around it and there's so many investors in the market people are up in arms saying i don't know what i'm going to do they're, they're looking to sell their properties straight away um i've got personal friends of mine who are saying i'm not even going to invest in south australia anymore why would i when i can go to interstate and or overseas and do things over there where i'm not getting slugged by our own government because we already pay the most stamp duty in australia being in south australia as well Right, we pay some of the most taxes. Our, our council rates, everything's ridiculously high for for us, and our cost of living stays the same. The wages aren't really going anywhere, 
and it's just costing us more money to, to live here. So it's scary for young ones. I'm, I'm early 30s. For me, who, who's someone who wants to build a property portfolio to build wealth for my family into the future, I can't go past a couple of properties now before I start getting slugged and the property is going to cost me more than what I can make from it anyway. So what's going to be the point of that? Yeah. You know? uh, look, the really important point that, the, um, that we've made, um, and I wrote an article in the, in the advertise, I'm happy to share, share sure. the link to it, but yeah. um, the, the context around land tax in, in, in a state-by-state comparison can't just... The, the government set out that we will be the average, the highest rate... Uh, the top rate for land tax in South Australia will be the average of all the other states. Mm. But the return in South Australia is, is not the same. So th- there is uh, the capital growth rate we see here. Uh, we, we know that m- even um, Melbourne and Sydney, the returns uh, and the risk too, because it's such a growing market, there are more people uh, heading to Victoria um, um, every 27 days than as many grow in Adelaide. We get to Adelaide. Is that right? Population growth. So they have, they have more people coming to their state. Uh, they have um, higher growth rates. They've got pop, good population uh, growth. And so in that context, we've always said that South Australian land tax rates should be not uh, the average. Um, they need to be better. We, mm. need to, we need to be a place where everybody says, I'm going to invest in South Australia because... For example, under the previous government, they abolished commercial stamp duty. Sure. So we already know that there are a number of commercial investors who have said, you know, a good thing about South Australia is I can buy and sell as I need and I don't get hit with stamp duty. So that's created movement in that market mm. uh, and a more efficient use of resources. So we, we've we said um, there needs to be reform, but we need to be not equal to or in the ballpark, we need to be more competitive than the other states because um, that's how we will uh, be successful. We can't shrink our way to prosperity is one of the phrases I like to use. Yes. We need to grow and we need to be competitive. Well, for a government who sort of sells like we're here to grow the state, it feels like it's the opposite effect of what they're, they're trying to achieve. You know, I, I see this doing things in other industries and the you know, there's all the promotion too. But what really got under my skin was the other day I was on LinkedIn and I saw an ad about land tax from, from the Liberal government and Stephen Marshall was talking saying we're going to be saving $80 million from reducing 3.7 to 2.4. Now, that just seems like a cheesy sales tactic to me where you sort of start higher, you know, this number is what it was and now it's here. But really, that 2.4, I mean, compared to the rest of Australia, is still quite high, isn't it? Well, the, the Premier would say that it's average um, it's the average of the other states, and you can point out to Queensland maybe being a little bit higher, uh, but certainly New South Wales is a lot lower. Mm. But a really important point, and this is why it's such a, um, a, a co- it's a complex area, and there are so many variables that it's yeah. easy to say things and confuse people. Mm. The fact is, is that the top rate in places like New South Wales, I, I'm pretty sure it's New South Wales, kicks in at around 10 million. So there are a lot of there are other states where the top rate kicks in at a much, much higher threshold. threshold. Yeah. So our land tax, our top land tax rate will kick in at 1.1 million. Now, if, if it's, it's fine wow. to say it's the average, but it doesn't mean much when... When it's $9 thresh- million dollars less than the rest. <laughs> yeah, the threshold is, is a whole lot lower because wow. what, we need to, what you need to do is look at exactly how much you will pay. This is what investors do. They look at how much you will actually pay. They don't care about... Com- the rate that you compare for political reasons. They look at how much you'll pay and what the property growth rate is. Yep. And that's how they come up to their risk and re- return decision. And so it is a little bit um, selective to be able to say, yep, we're, we're the average of the, of the rates across the country when the threshold is a whole lot lower. But I would, I will, you know, I've got to say that heading, it is, that is heading in the right direction. I, you know, and I do believe the government has got a, a an agenda to, to grow. Why would they have anything else? I know that the, the, the government wants to grow. Um, they're doing some some other things in infrastructure, and they're trying to grow some some other areas of the economy. But we um, land and property development uh, represents such a substantial portion of our future. And the thing about land tax and the thing about investing in property is that South Australians investing in South Australia, and yeah. that's the thing that we are most concerned about. We need. 
uh, to make sure that South Australians are investing in South Australia, not South Australians deciding to invest in other states, like you mentioned, you know, you ask yourself the question why you wouldn't do that. Yeah. Because we will see our wealth leave South Australia. And that and that's and that's not a good scenario. Definitely. And we've already got people leaving for jobs because of the wages obviously get paid a lot more interstate than you do here for, for the same career. Um, I've had heaps of friends, you know, since I finished uni that have gone interstate to be successful in their careers and overseas too, because it's just you know, we we get slugged here everywhere. Whichever way you look at it, taxes, uh, stamp duty, uh, wages for for our jobs, like we're not getting as much as everywhere else. And I think I think we're not even classed sort of as a major city now. Being in LA is more of sort of a big country town compared to the rest of Australia. Isn't is that how we sort of get looked at? Yeah, really? that, that's true. Yeah, well, yeah. I took great exception to that. The Infrastructure Australia report recently came out, and that's a Commonwealth report. Sure, and. Um, they looked at all of the cities across Australia and they said that you know, Brisbane and Sydney and Melbourne and Perth were our major cities and everything else was classified as either a satellite or a regional city. Yeah. And, Adelaide, and Adelaide is in that. And I, and, and I think it's a really sad situation. And, I, and I'm not just, that's not just, we're not talking about just the, you know, the, the Marshall government in the last 12 months. We're no. talking about a, a trend that's been there for, for 20 years uh, or more, you know, we, we used to be, um, there used to be as many people here as there were in Brisbane and, and you know, before Victoria embarked on its on its reforms, they had manufacturing uh, in Victoria that was yeah. the same type of economy as we had, but they transformed and changed. Um, we need to do that. And, and that, going back to the land tax, transforming and changing is about being bold and taking some risks. And I'd have to say, if you ask most of the people who are in business whether or not we should or the treasurer should be focusing on having an entirely balanced budget and um, i would say well at the end of the day we do need to be prudent economic managers but perhaps now's the time to make an investment if it means that our budget isn't balanced if gst revenue of 564 million which they took a hit to meant that we're in deficit well perhaps it would have been better to be just a little bit in deficit and to create some certainty and so we're making some headways into reducing land tax rather than have a balanced budget but at the same time reduce confidence sure and ultimately we lose we lose our investors yeah and we all we do is snowball the problem into shrinking further and further and becoming smaller and smaller we yeah. say um, you need to be bold in terms of growing and you need to invest to do that sure so the the, the first the first thresholds they've put up to 450,000 that was from what was it earlier i think it was about 380 from memory like that, but yeah. um, so so there were a couple of there were a couple of um, commitments that the government made prior sure. to the last election they said they would cut the top rate and yeah. they said they would increase uh, the threshold those things are actually locked in in not the last budget but the budget before so the budget immediately after the election so there was already some um, some ta land tax relief and it was going in the right way. Mm. What we saw in the recent budget announcement was this change to aggregation, which, um, yeah. again, I've, I've explained that reform. There might yeah. be some some winners and some losers, but what we're saying is that you know th there should have been a pathway, really, to make sure that we didn't lose confidence along the way. Definitely. So... Obviously, it's people with multiple investment properties, but say if I have one investment property, but it's in Henley Beach, and my land value is six hundred thousand, yeah, does that still come into play with me now for the new tax yeah, reform? Yeah, so it, yeah, it will. So in that in that scenario, um, your your threshold's gone up to four fifty. So for four hundred and fifty thousand of that six fifty, you're not paying any tax, and you pay tax on the the 200,000 between 450 to 650 where your property is valued and it's conceivable that you for that one property will um, will perhaps pay less that's one property mm. the challenge we've got is that if there are people with two or three properties under trust and they pay that amount for each property when you add them all up and all of a sudden your total value of your properties is at 1.95 million, mm -hmm. your rate is a whole lot higher and you will pay more than before. So what we've essentially got is a tax that's not really promoting growth. It might be okay for, for one, 
uh, might be okay for a couple of smaller value properties, but when you start to uh, tax in a, the way that land tax operates, yeah. you're really dissuading people from growing anymore. So they might say, I've got one, now I'm ready for my second. Okay, or well maybe with the second I'll buy it interstate. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, you know this, uh, Michael, you mm. can look online for a property, you can get pictures and you can pretty much with VR walk around, have a look. You can have an agent um, do the transaction for you remotely. Sure. You can have a property. You can buy and sell a property. And all same, the same tax laws, Commonwealth tax laws around negative gearing all apply whether you own the property in New South Wales, Queensland or South Australia. So you don't even really need to leave your lounge room to invest in a property. Yeah, That's, that is... <laughs> I mean, that's what I'm saying. That's why I foresee the problem. This is the growth for us is just limited now um, coming up, you know, and even the ones who are established now. Say, I know some developers that have 64 properties, you know, that that tax bill to me is going to be like $600,000. Yeah. Like, yeah, well, depending, again, I can't give any individual advice, yeah, no, but depending course. how they've structured their, their portfolios, uh, they might, like I said, these reforms might mean that there are winners and losers. If the top rack tax rate comes down, there may be some people that, that get some relief in that space. But what we're primarily worried about are those um, small investors yeah. uh, who have you know, mums and dads who've got two or three. Um, and they may be people who've bought property who, who uh, let's be clear, they might have started their property journey well before self-managed super funds, well before compulsory superannuation. So we're talking about people who have a, a who have a, a preference for property because they've they're, they're, they may be migrants who've come over to Australia sure. who don't have a, mm. a lot of understanding as it relates to other investment vehicles. So they've chosen to put their fam their savings in properties and they've got a good accountant that said, okay, well it's entirely legal for you to have two or three trusts, you should do this. Yeah. And then all of a sudden they're, um, they're faced with, with a change here. And, and they're the people we're really, really worried about. I percent because it's like it's legal one day and it's illegal the next. Like as soon Correct. as that, that change comes in in June, it's uh, <laughs> what you've been doing that legally this whole time, the law's changed and now that's classed as an illegal thing and yeah. you, you're just going to... Well, yeah, we've got to be ca careful. I mean, it's um, the, 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 the description would be, you know, not... not um, you, not like you're going to get arrested, yeah, but yeah. yeah. But, but, you, but you, you will, you'll get assessed in a different way. Sure. So your requirements, it, of course... And that means that you don't have a choice. If you if you have three properties and they are in the three separate trusts and they're in your name, mm. you will be required to declare that you are the beneficial. That means you it's you that owns it. Sure. If those three trusts that uh, that are yours, and you have to pay land tax. And um, yeah, I should say that there are some options. It gets a bit compl complex that you can elect to pay a surcharge. Um, but that that could mean up to an increase in five thousand dollars for every property that you pay to simply say, well, I won't put them all together, hmm. but I'll pay the I'll pay essentially the the charge. Is that every year as well that surcharge? Yep. Wow. So what would happen is if you've got a property, let's say, say you've got a property that's worth um, one point one million or one and a half million. Hmm. If it's in a trust and you don't want to add that property to all the others, you pay uh, a surcharge, which means that you'll pay essentially an additional about an additional five thousand now that, that's a little bit less for, for smaller properties sure uh, but again it's a complex area with many thresholds and many, many rates and many uh, different legal um, avenues for you to structure your portfolio definitely so if you if you've been so, like you said like your example just earlier you've been sort of you're older you're sort of getting to that pensioners age now you've got a few properties that you've sort of built up for your family and mm -hmm. got a bit of income and you're at retirement age now, that would affect you quite drastically, I think, you know, because you don't get much for the pension here. Um, and if you're relying on that income to sort of live as a pensioner, and, you know, say if I'm making, you know, $20,000 from the one property and uh, I'm only paying a few grand uh, land tax at the moment and that goes up, well, that seems to me like that's going to be quite a hit to these older people right all these people will need to make decisions they'll be faced with you know if you if you've got property and uh, your land tax bill increases and um, you don't have spare cash reserves to cover that land tax bill I mean every investor will make a sensible or most of them will make a decision based on how much rent do I get what is the land tax bill um, and can I or can't I afford it and what is the capital growth here now if the land if the land tax bill um, 
can't be covered or is only just covered by the rent, then there's only a few things going to happen. The rent goes up um, or you sell the property. And that's um, I'm not sure that people are going to hold on to property. Um, you know, again, individual circumstances are different and people might have a negative cash flow for tax reasons. There might be a whole range of different things. But you can't, the, the simple fact is you can't take money out of the system you can't take more tax away from people and think it's not going to have an impact and yeah. you can look at it at a, i know the government is pretty keen to look at it at the big picture so they say well we are it's costing us money we're actually making a commitment here in terms of the amount we collect but if you look carefully you'll see that there is about 118 million dollars collected from these changes but yeah. then of course there's some winners that might pay lower rate it's cold comfort for the people who are having to contribute to that extra 180 million that someone else is paying less. Yeah. There are winners and losers, and rolling out reform with winners and losers requires skill. Yeah. Um, and it requires, uh, you know, a, a dialogue with the sector and mm. an understanding of what they're doing. I mean, so if if they're going to make these changes and reform sort of land tax. Are there going to be other taxes like stamp duty and, and, and council rates and things that we pay at the moment that are going to be reduced at all? Or is that all going to stay, all get increased? Or what's going to happen Well, there? I mean, the government said that their, their, their agenda is land tax, and mm. so they went to the election with that. Uh, they haven't made any noises about stamp duty. We have made noises about stamp duty. We've said that stamp duty and land tax as a total for property should be looked at and reformed. Mm. We think that perhaps there might be opportunities to to, to um, broaden, what's called broaden the base of land tax. So uh, if everybody pays just a little bit more, maybe we could get rid of stamp duty, mm. which might mean that more people can buy and sell, which makes a market we'll help more it out. Point. So yeah. it helps it out. So we've had some, some ideas around that. Um, but there's another big thing we haven't talked about at all that's kind of happening at the moment. It's called the revaluation. Sure. So the value of general is uh, the government... Um, the government representative who's responsible for looking at how much each property um, is valued at. So when you get your council rates, it might say you're in Unley, this land is worth uh, $500,000. Now what they've done is they've gone around, um, started with the Unley and started with the um, with Walkerville and I think that the city, and they're looking at properties and they're saying, okay, when was the last time this was valued? And they might say, well, the fair value now is not 500000 it actually is worth Six hundred or seven hundred thousand. Now, what we've heard is that some of these property value valuations are seeing increases of up to forty percent, fifty percent. Of course, wow. when you've got a forty or fifty percent increase in the, your your land value, your tax bill is going to go up. So this is a this is another. Um, it is at the same time. Correct. This is another. So this is another really big thing that we've said to the government is that you you can't. It's it's government's responsibility. Government, whether it's Labor or Liberal, mm -hmm. they've had to take responsibility for the fact that we've got to a situation where value property values have there hasn't been a revaluation, and we've got to this to this this scenario where they're now saying that we're going to do it, and we're going to do it in a hurry, and then doing that at the same time as they're changing land tax. You, we say, while you're revaluing properties, if the property values are wrong and they need to be fixed, just stop these land tax changes and let that run its course and then we can talk about reforming the land tax system so uh, you know to do them at the same time is it's, it's kind of like it's a double it is a double whammy and what we have also said is even with the revaluation the government is elected to lead and the government should say and they can if they really want to limit the increases to, to potentially say well if the property is worth double what it's been listed as Let's have a pathway that says, okay, over the next certain amount of years, it will go up by this much, so that, um, and that can be the rule for everybody. So you have to control um, it a little bit. But, but right? you know, that, it's about maintaining confidence. It's about maintaining uh, momentum. It's about being in tune with what the market's doing mm. uh, and leading. Well, if, if if they're if they're bringing up everything and they're not bringing anything down, it doesn't really seem fair to anyone, does it? It's like, yep. uh, and and. From my understanding, well, we do a lot of valuations, like obviously on property, if we're dealing with it. And is it still the independent bodies doing these valuations as well? Well, so the value of general, the, the government would argue that the value of general is is independent to to what is called the legislature, so sure. the, the elected politicians. Sure. And they say, well, we we're at arm's length about that. 
But, you know, at the end of the day, the government's elected to, to lead and there's nothing stopping the government from doing what they need to in, in the parliament with yeah. an act to be able to say, um, you know, these independent valuations, I, I understand that, you know, they, they can be challenged. So there is a mechanism if the valuation of the property doesn't look right, you can challenge it. There is There are mechanisms for you to, to, to do that. That's... That's a given, and that's that's the right thing to do. Mm. But um, mm. it is also the government's responsibility to understand that if you are going through a process where you're changing the value of a property as part of a revaluation, that um, it's called having a fair go. Yeah. You know? So if you're gonna if you're going to if you're going to fix something, if you're going to revalue, then at least have regard to what you're doing to the market. Well, even the timing of it all. I mean, it would, it would take years to properly. Reevaluate each property individually. Yeah, so right? there's a big project going on, and they yeah. and they and they're going through them. We've already heard, uh, you know, nightmare stories of people who've got properties in Nunley that have gone up forty percent, fifty percent. It's a nightmare. And, exactly. and so the, the the first thing they do is challenge it immediately, and and, and you know they have to go through that process. But at the same time, they could be challenging the valuation, mm. but they're also faced with well, what's going to happen in um, next year. And of course, this is all subject to going through the parliament. So there is a there will be a very robust debate. And right as we are talking now, the the, uh, the opposition is holding some forums. And I know there was a forum uh, sure. here in Prospect with the local member only, I think last week. Mm. So there's a lot of people interested, um, but there's still a lot of uncertainty. It's yeah, it's it's, it's crazy that it's all happening at the one time, and. Mm. Um, it just doesn't feel very thought through in, in that regard. And, and yeah, it's just hard to see sort of a way out of it if, if it does go through for a lot of people um, and just for the market in, in general. Like, I can't see anything else but it sort of just coming to a bit of a crash, to be honest with well, you. Well, yeah. there will be a dislocation. The fact yeah. is, is that if this legislation goes through, there are winners and there are losers. And when there are... Um, when there are changes like this, there are adjustments. Yeah. Um, there are always, there's always going to be activity uh, as the market kind of settles settles down. Now, what the what the long term look of the market is, and what where property values are, etc. In ten years' time, if these these you know, things kind of pass through, sure. um, the government might argue that uh, that it'll all settle down and, and it won't be, um, you know. But they argue that in the context of a of a of a whole market they look at the state and look at average prices behind every average price there are thousands and thousands of ordinary people yeah. who are impacted so um you know we we um we need to be cognizant of how many people there are um that are being impacted potentially in an unfair way yep. uh, in such short notice when um rather than just think about it as you know the the, the average rates across the entire country, which is a very dry economist's view. Definitely. And, and it, would it apply to foreign investors as well? Because, um, you know, they already get charged an, an, an extra surcharge of about 7% at the moment on top of stamp duty for Correct. anything that they purchase. Yep. So would that still apply to foreign investors? Yeah, look, land tax does apply to investors from, from, in, from interstate uh, and, from, and from overseas. There are, in fact, some... Um, some mm. uh, other states that actually treat not they call them non-residents I think so there's yeah. actually a differential rate for for people who are um, in other uh, who are from overseas so it's a complex area and there are many different thresholds and diff many different legal definitions and treatments across the entire country that's what we have in Australia yeah I mean all right so what advice would you give now to people who are sort of umming and ahhing about it. Obviously, go see your accountant and try and work through it that way. But is there any other advice that you can give to people right now that you know are really stressed about the land tax issue, or can they get involved and help you in any way to yeah. uh, fight against it? Yeah, look, um, we have uh, on the um, UDI, it's uh, udiasa.com.au yeah. website. Yeah. Uh, at the very top of that, you'll see action on land tax is a is a link. You can click on that, and it goes through a landing page. We have a survey that you can fill in, uh, and it doesn't it just asks you to put your name and scribble a signature and we've got uh, we've got hundreds and hundreds already in there and we think that that's going to grow uh, yeah. substantially um so you can join join that if you like we're simply saying to the government 
you know, um, we would like you to stop this aggregation measure. Sure. Um, and our position is that you need to stop this while the revaluation is occurring and we need to kind of go back to the drawing board. So you can certainly find information about that on our website there. Mm -hmm. um, the advice I would give to people is you need to just keep, keep um, a close look at what's going on. Sure. Um, that's the reason why we're having such a robust discussion. It's the reason why we've been so vocal is because I can't unfortunately give anyone a, 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 you know, any kind of um, real comfort if the legislation gets through the parliament and you have had multiple properties in, in trusts, um, you will need to um, work out what that means yeah. for you. You may very well be up for uh, a land tax bill. There is really nothing you can do uh, to, to get away from from that. Um, there may be some people who, who, will be, uh, who will win from the top rate coming down, but there might, will be a lot of people who won't. Yeah. Uh, I think you need to just keep close eye on it. I think the, the thing is at 30th of June, if, if these laws are passed, you are levied at 30th of June next year, and it doesn't matter whether you, um, it doesn't matter whether you <laughs> sold it after or not, you, that land bill that land tax bill is yours. It's coming, yeah. And, and you need to, and you do need to make sure you've got good, good advice and are ready for it. But right now, we are, um, we're still having that discussion with the government. Uh, mm. Right now, there are a lot of politicians from the opposition, uh, independents, uh, a lot of media commentators and industry groups are saying, just, just take a step back, uh, government, and listen to what we're saying, um, and reset, recalibrate, and let's have a proper discussion. Yeah. Um, and we'll continue to fight that. So I do encourage anyone um, who, who, um, who's really worried about this to visit our website, udiasa.com.au, and I'm happy to provide that link. No, we'll put the link in. So all our listeners, all our subscribers, if you haven't subscribed, subscribe now. But um, definitely have a look at that link. Help uh, UDIA out and, and Pat in, in, in this cause because uh, I, I do see it sort of crashing us right here, and it's pretty scary if uh, we don't sort of um, you know, stand up against it as as one together so um pat i want to thank you for your time today and for coming in and for doing this um i'd love to do it again soon get a bit more of an update um, as things are progressing through closer to the end of the financial year um but we'll put those links in in the description and and everyone can sort of click on and, and have a bit more do you have a function coming up where people can sort of hear you speak at all or yeah we do have a number of different functions um and i'm um pleased to say that not everything uh, we do is is about um you know um, opposing or fighting, um, you know, what I would sometimes call the insur insurance policy on, policy on stupidity. But um, we um, <laughs> we do um, we do do a number of things, and we have uh, our awards coming up. So yeah. uh, end of October, there's a Friday afternoon. We have awards at the convention center, and we celebrate um, the best master plan communities and medium density and um, young professionals. So there's some really good things. So anyone who's interested in property development, anyone who's interested as a consultant um, mm -hmm. in getting um, learning about the industry of professional development courses, uh, have a look at those. Yep. Um, we will continue to keep people um, updated, our members updated on the land tax. Sure. Have a look at the landing page. Um, and also I'd be more than happy to kind of come in because there's a lot of great things happening in, in development. We, mm. do, we do more than just tax, we talk about um, the way in which people choose to, to live, changing living patterns, um, the, the, the design of, of buildings, um, the way in which master plan communities are kind of um, evolving, um, high oh, yeah. rise, a whole range of things. So, You've done some amazing things yeah, so. from, from what I've seen around the place, which is great. And um, check him out, Pat, UDIA uh, South Australia. I really appreciate your time and I look forward to doing it again soon. Well, All right. Thank you, Michael. Cheers, Cheers. mate. Thanks Thank for you. coming on. Bye.